I'm John Alger, president here at James Madison University, and I want to welcome you to the Forbes Center Concert Hall. Today, we continue our new tradition in this space, the Madison Vision Series. This series has been developed to advance the university's efforts to prepare students to be educated and enlightened citizens who lead productive and meaningful lives by looking at contemporary issues in an engaged society. This series will bring prominent speakers to campus to look at our current civic landscape through the prism of creating an engaged and enlightened citizenry. Later this academic year, we'll be privileged to be joined by Cynthia Cooper, the WorldCom corporate whistleblower on November 13th, Jeffrey Rosen, the chief executive officer of the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia, who will be with us during Madison week in March, and our own Carly Fiorina, who of course is a member of the current JMU Board of Visitors, and she'll be with us in April. Some of you may be familiar with the Madison quote in the tunnel connecting the Forbes Center to the Quad, knowledge will forever govern ignorance, or the quote at the top of your program, the advancement and diffusion of knowledge is the only guardian of true liberty. Those quotes capture not just the purpose of this series, but also the purpose of higher education, and in particular, the liberal arts and sciences education that we strive to offer here at James Madison University. As the institution named for James Madison, we have a special responsibility to foster this dialogue. We believe that this education meets the demands of the 21st century, demands for more college-educated workers who will be engaged citizens and lifelong learners. So how do we ensure that our students are prepared for a rapidly changing landscape in terms of technology and innovation and globalization? What skills will they need to succeed and thrive over the course of their careers and their lives? How do we produce graduates who will contribute to our civic good? Now, this last question might be particularly important as we watch events in Washington unfolding. So today's speaker is one of the nation's leading voices on these important topics. Dr. Carol Geary Schneider is president of the Association of American Colleges and Universities, or AACNU for short. With nearly 1,300 member institutions drawn from all aspects of higher education, AACNU is the leading national organization devoted to advancing and strengthening undergraduate liberal education. Under Dr. Schneider's leadership, AACNU launched Liberal Education and America's Promise, or LEAP, L-E-A-P, a public advocacy and campus action initiative designed to engage students and the public with what really matters in a college education for the 21st century. The LEAP campaign builds in turn on AACNU's major effort with which some of you may be familiar called Greater Expectations, the Commitment to Quality as a Nation Goes to College, which was an initiative designed to articulate the aims of a 21st century liberal education and to identify comprehensive, innovative models that improve learning for all undergraduate students. AACNU has studied and advocated for high-impact learning practices and has engaged institutions and employers across the country in a national conversation on these big-picture issues. Carol and the AACNU have also been champions for extending the benefits of liberal arts and sciences education to students of all backgrounds, including those who have been historically underserved, and to infusing these values across the entire curriculum. Dr. Schneider has a bachelor's degree in history from Mount Holyoke College and a PhD in history from Harvard. She's taught at the University of Chicago, DePaul, Chicago State, and Boston University, and has published extensively. Dr. Schneider has received 11 honorary degrees and a number of national awards in higher education. For example, in 2013, she was honored as one of Diverse Magazine's 25 leading women in higher education. Finally, on a personal note, let me add that I have known Carol for many years, and I consider her to be one of the great thinkers and leaders in higher education. So, it is my distinct honor 
to welcome to the Forbes Center stage, Dr. Carol Geary Schneider. Well, thank you so much for that very kind introduction, for the opportunity to be with you, and not least for the opportunity to be away, however briefly, from Washington, D.C. <laughs> I am mindful always of the notion, of the humility that must accompany the good news that I have come here from Washington to give you advice. Um, <laughs> So let me hasten to say uh, that it's a special privilege and honor to come to James Madison University because you have been partners with us for uh, the entire length of my presidency at AACNU. And a good many of the things that I'm going to be talking about tonight, you have been pioneering at JMU. And um, the discussion tonight, I think, is about how we take the extre extremely strong foundations that you've already laid and carry them to another level for your students. And uh, as Jonathan has so wonderfully said, and a vision for engaged and civically responsible liberal education that can, in fact, serve our society and our democracy. So that's my topic for tonight. How do we think about liberal education, engaged learning, student success? How do we think about these things in the context of a renewed commitment to preparing students uh, for leadership in a society that takes its own democratic heritage seriously and puts, moves ethical questions to the center? Uh, and how do we do this in ways that build on the extraordinary work that you have already done here in creating a highly engaged and increasingly influential uh, model for undergraduate education? So uh, you should have found, as you came in, um, a, a handout. At many points, I'm going to be referring to it, so it'd be helpful to you to have it in your hands so that we can uh, look at its, uh, its topics together. Jonathan mentioned LEAP. Uh, the work that I'm describing is central to what AACNU calls its LEAP campaign. I am not going to describe that campaign, but I have given you on page two of your handout an overview of what's involved, uh, who takes part, what, what we're actually doing, and you can review that for yourself. Uh, in my remarks, um, I'm going to be talking about the, the terms of our discussion. What do we actually mean by liberal education, and how does it support meaningful student success? Uh, what does it mean within that broader context to refocus on civic and ethical purposes of liberal education and to make them actually pervasive across the educational experience? What practices can get us there? Uh, what is the role of high-impact practices in developing a national model for an engaged and civic-minded and ethical university? And what does it, all of this mean for James Madison and your own uh, inspiring determination to, as you have said to yourself and your students, be the change? So those, those, that's the overview of the whole talk, and let's turn now to what it really means to clarify our terms. How many of you are, in fact, students? Hands up. And how many of you arrived at JMU with a really solid understanding of what it meant to get a liberal education? Any hands up? <laughs> uh, and that's the insight, really, that stands behind our LEAP initiative, that, in fact, we need to clarify our terms in order to help, under pe pe under help people understand what it is that a liberal education provides at its best and why it matters so much to students' long-term success in many fronts. We really need to begin to clarify the language. So liberal education isn't, in fact, the most commonly used term for much of what I'm about to describe. But AACNU has very deliberately gone back to the 19th century and the 18th century, to Thomas Jefferson's and James Madison's term, for describing the kind of education that would secure a free society. Uh, and I'm going to be distinguishing in these remarks among liberal education on the one hand, general education in which you are a national leader on the second hand, the liberal arts and sciences which are foundational to general education and also to liberal education. But the main uh, point of this whole approach to liberal education is to argue that what we're talking about doesn't belong just to general education, isn't limited to the arts and sciences only, although they are important to it, but that our real focus is on liberal education across the curriculum, all students, all majors, all parts of the educational experience, formal, informal, curricular, co-curricular. 
So that's the general idea, and uh, you'll see a guide to commonly confused terms that you might like to take away on page three of the handout, uh, and a, a more elaborate definition of liber liberal education that I will be articulating in these remarks going forward. But in brief, what is it we're talking about when we talk about providing students with a liberal education? I want to argue that there are three enduring goals certainly since the founding of colleges and universities in starting with the 18th century in our own society. Uh, and, but if you go back over the millennia, if you go back to what Cicero is talking about when he talks about education, there are three enduring goals uh, that uh, remain important, remain primary to what we mean by liberal education. The first is that a liberal and liberating education provides students with broad knowledge of their own world, the world around them, of science, of history, of society, of cultures. It's the knowledge you need for successful leadership in a world in which you have standing. And of course, for a very long time, that kind of knowledge was restricted only to a tiny fraction of the population. But the opportunity we have today is that this kind of leadership knowledge becomes democratic civic knowledge, knowledge that matters to everyone. So broad knowledge is, is foundational to it. The second is a focus on the powers of the mind, because ultimately that is all we have to solve the many problems we face in our own lives, in work, and in society. So the way in which we've thought about developing powers of the mind, reasoning, discernment, judgment, has evolved over time. Uh, it was certainly approached differently in the 12th century or the 16th century or the 18th century from what we are doing now, but the focus on taking your intellectual capacities to their highest level of, of development and making them permanent resources is crucial to the notion of liberal education. And the third, again, uh, you can track it back to the ancient world and it remains central today for all of us, is a notion of cultivating personal integrity. Graduating students who see it as their role to take responsibility for the ethical challenges they will face in life and who see it as part of their role to contribute to the greater good. So enduring goals, but also evolving practices. Liberal education is our premier tradition in American higher education. It's what you get in every honors program in the country. It's what you get at all the most selective colleges in the country, including institutions like MIT, which are much better known for their work in STEM. They provide a liberal education to their students, and it's what you get here at James Madison University, a liberal education uh, that prepares you um, with all those forms of learning that I just described. But equally important, the reason liberal education has remained our premier tradition is because it never stands firm. It is always connecting what it does with the needs of the world around it, and it is always rethinking its practices, as you are doing, to ensure that students are optimally prepared for the challenges of the particular time and place they find themselves in. Now, for the founders, it was profoundly clear that we needed liberal education, solid in the liberal arts and sciences, to ensure the future of freedom, that there was a close and necessary connection between cultivating civic virtue and ensuring the future of a free society. The governors in our society are you, the citizens, not the people who are behaving so badly at the moment in our Congress. We sent them there, but we also can recall them. They are finally uh, uh, obliged to us. But that raises the standing of our role in providing leadership for a society that makes changes, uh, decisions and choices that influence not just our own communities, but for the United States, influences the rest of the world as well. So all of this was crystal clear uh, to our founders. It was crystal clear throughout the 19th century. It was crystal clear as late as the um, post-World War II era, and I'll come back to that in a couple of minutes. But I think we would all agree that today, American society has largely lost sight of the civic and ethical purposes of liberal education. We don't hear those talked about, and we need to. It's in that context that AAC and you decided to spend at least a decade, and now we know it would be more than that, uh, with what we call our LEAP initiative. We are working to reclaim a broader understanding of what matters in a 21st century education and to drive those purposes and commitments centrally into all parts of the educational experience. I, I've got two ways of representing this. One is on page four of your handout. And we actually captured there the 20th century understanding of liberal education and contrast it with where we're going today. So if you look at page four and look at the right-hand column, 
What we're arguing is that this is a necessity for all students. It's essential for success in a global economy, also for informed citizenship at home and abroad, that it provides intellectual, civic, personal, and professional development together, and that this is achieved by studies that emphasize a set of essential learning outcomes across the entire educational experience, all fields of study, general education working together. So the vision is one of all schools, uh, all, whether we're talking about community colleges and technical programs or the purest liberal arts only institution, we really are talking about an education that invests in the future of democracy and the future of individual success for all of our students across the entire educational experience. The heart of this is what we call the um, leap um, essential goals for liberal education, essential learning outcomes. They're captured in the PowerPoint briefly and in more detail on page five of your handout. Uh, and they should be familiar to you because these are, as I said, we developed this vision in partnership with you and thoughtful institutions like you. Uh, and we believe they capture the kind of learning you are trying to provide to your students. As you see, the LEAP Essential Learning Outcomes build on those enduring goals of liberal education that I described before, but they carry those goals into a 21st century context with 21st century particulars. So we still want students to have broad knowledge of human cultures in the natural and physical world achieved through studies in the arts and sciences. But there's, the argument in LEAP is that these studies need to be focused by students' engagement with big questions, significant questions, questions that may be enduring over time or important to our time but questions whose importance the students themselves can see. Uh, a set of intellectual and practical skills that are fun foundational to your general education program and to liberal education at JMU. Our, the argument is that these need to be practiced extensively from before you ever get to college and taken to a higher level so that they are in fact part of students' portfolio when they graduate from this institution. We've also lifted up in this vision the notion that we are educating students for citizenship. Uh, we've called this education for personal and social responsibility, and the particulars are exactly what you are talking about here as you go through your strategic plan and put together your direction for the future. We want students who have civic knowledge and engagement at home and abroad, intercultural learning and competence, ethical reasoning and action, uh, and the foundations for continued uh, lifelong learning. But we also want to make sure that students have anchored that sense of civic and personal responsibility in direct uh, work with and learning from communities beyond the academy. That is not enough to talk about civic virtue here. We really need to be engaged with the world around us. And I know that this is an area in which JMU is already a leader. But the thing that I would argue makes this a 21st century vision and just differentiates it from earlier conceptions of liberal education is the emphasis on integrating and applying learning. It's not enough to know. It's not enough to have the skills. It's not even enough to have a sense of civic and ethical obligation. What really matters is whether our graduates can integrate all that and apply it to problems that matter to them, to, that matter to our society, that matter in the workplace. What can they do with their learning? That is the core question we would argue we all need to be asking ourselves as we work to make the most the most of this important tradition for our students. Now, cued by the discussion I know you're having here in the context of your strategic plan and inspired, frankly, by the mission that you have as an institution, I have focused this remark, this talk, primarily on civic and ethical engagement. But we are in a moment in time when everyone wants to know, OK, how does this work for jobs? What do employers think about this? Is this too theoretical? Is it too idealistic? Is it practical enough to help our students make their way in a very challenging economic environment? And AACNU has taken that exact question very seriously uh, in the course of our LEAP campaign. Before we launched it, we brought employers to the table. We listened to them. We noticed that they didn't use the vocabulary of liberal and liberal arts education. But if you listen to what they actually wanted from our graduates, they wanted more, not less, of what I've been talking about. Uh, we have also commissioned a set of surveys of employers. There are four of them all together. And I've brought you some information, which you'll find on page six, uh, from the latest survey. Uh, it's called It Takes More Than a Major. And what it shows is that employers strongly value the hallmark leap goals for success um, in the, uh, 
the hallmark goals for liberal learning and see them as central to success in the workplace, they also value the very practices that help to build civic and ethical problem solving ca capacities. So you'll find that on page six and you'll see a ver that the questions that were given to employers took two forms. One was, here's a set of outcomes uh, that many institutions are working on. Which do you think require less the same or more attention? So if it has a little diamond by it, the employers said, we want more attention to these outcomes. And you will see that they want more attention to um, many of the intellectual skills, and they want more attention to ethical decision making as well. Um, the second question had to do with whatever a student's major, do you strongly agree, somewhat agree, not agree, strongly disagree, that all students need the following? So the questions about broad knowledge in the liberal arts and sciences, or broad global knowledge, or um, um, direct experience with community problem solving, those all came from questions that took the, that form that I've just described. Now for the work that you are doing, uh, thinking through your, the Madison Collaborative, the commitment to ethical reasoning across the curriculum, ways to build on your civic uh, history and mission, I think it's the findings under personal and social responsibility that are really most uh, significant for you. 91% of the employers said that they would like students to have more experiences in uh, problem solving in diverse settings. And the actual item was more experiences solving problems with people whose views are different than their own. More experience solving problems with people whose views are different than their own. 91%, this survey was taken when we were already bound up in knots in Washington. I think there is a longing in our society for people who can negotiate together and solve problems across difference. But it's a workplace skill as well. And remember, this survey was focused on success in the economy. 87% would like to know that students had experience in dealing with ethical issues and problems important in their own field, not just in general education, but something important to the student's profession. 82% think that all students should be spending on time on civic knowledge, skills, and judgment, contributing to our society. And a different question about ethics, 64% want more attention to ethical decision making. So a very strong endorsement from employers of exactly the kinds of things that you are focusing on as uh, a, a, an educational community. So, Understanding that this is the vision for liberal education historically and today, and understanding that employers will be with you as you strengthen and deepen this uh, already strong commitment at JMU, what would it take to reclaim these civic and ethical purposes? I've thought a lot about this question. I care passionately about these issues, and it is deeply frustrating to me to see a national discussion, national policy discussion about education that is so relentlessly reductive to have coming from our own White House a plan to rate higher education that focuses only on whether or not students completed, whether or not they're employed after college, whether or not they defaulted on their loans. Our vision and our values takes in so much more than that. Um, and we have a long way to go before our society is with us uh, on this conception of education. And I've come to believe that is what is really needed is a strong, compelling, and widely embraced educational narrative that focuses not just on the goals for the curriculum, but on why these forms of learning are so important to democratic vitality, to America's global future, and to students' long-term well-being as well. And we do have in our recent uh, memory uh, exactly that kind of a compelling educational narrative, and I want to share a bit of it with you uh, as we think about how we go forward together with this vision. And that narrative was uh, located in the report of the Truman Commission on Higher Education in 1947. Six volume, we, we no longer write six volume reports on the future of higher education. We write 30 pages and we're done. Um, but uh, in 1947, educators took a hard look under the aegis of the White House on where higher education should go. And they began by identifying three and only three principal purposes of higher education. And here's what they are. The first is that education should aim and achieve a fuller realization of democracy in every phase of living. The second was that education should directly and expli explicitly build international understanding and cooperation. And the third, and in some ways my favorite, is that education should 
uh, lead to the application of creative imagination and trained intelligence to the solution of social problems. So democracy, international cooperation and understanding, the solution of social problems. Those were the primary goals and the only goals that governed the six volume vision for the future of higher education. Um, notice the absence of any attention to success in the workplace um, or jobs. Uh, we would undoubtedly, a vision for the 21st century would need to include the economy too. But imagine this big conception of what education is for, updated for our time and for our century. It would change the national dialogue. It would make it impossible to have the repeated slams against the humanities and the arts and some of the social sciences that we hear from policy leaders, from governors, from people who should know better. Because it is impossible to imagine that we could truly fulfill the promise of democracy at home or abroad, absent the learning one gets from the humanities and the social sciences. We couldn't do it with STEM alone, important as STEM is. You need both. You need the envisioning that comes from the humanities and the arts and the creative disciplines, as well as the uh, analytical precision and the, uh, the technical in innovation and creativity of the, the STEM and technical fields. So we need this bigger vision. Uh, and, and I would be delighted to see leadership from it coming from Virginia, a commonwealth uh, founded uh, in the, at, at the moment in which this country committed itself to democracy and liberty. Uh, this is the place where it should begin, and you have the right history to do it. So our vision might include the fuller realization of democracy, global co cooperation and understanding, solutions to the world's most urgent problems, uh, but it also would include connecting liberal education directly with the kind of brain power we need for the economy at this moment in time when it is critically dependent on innovation and creativity. I think by your history, by your mission, by your strategic direction, you are well positioned to help higher education articulate this kind of mission. And I hope you will see this opportunity as a, as a moment to take the wonderful work you have already done to the next level. So what might it mean for JMU to take its commitment to liberal education, general education, civic and ethical responsibility to the next level? I think there are two themes that are worth your time and attention as a community. The first is the notion that our students don't need just to be prepared uh, through attention to ethical questions and civic responsibility, but they need to tie that kind of learning to some of the world's myriad challenges. And we need, secondly, to map the pathways so that wherever students begin and wherever they complete their studies, they are always being reminded that they have responsibilities to self and others, and they are thinking hard about what this means for their work, their achievement, uh, their commitments both here and beyond. And what are the challenges that we might uh, connect our civic and ethical inquiries with? Obviously, they are huge. In our democracy, um, the multiplication of cultures uh, has become a challenge for our identity as who we think we are as a society. Within the academy, we take it for granted that inclusion and excellence are our mission, but we are still fighting bitterly about those, those issues in the wider world. We have work to do with our society on what it means to be a diverse and multicultural democracy committed to equity and justice for all. In the economy, we're obviously in the midst of painful dislocations and volatility, and this isn't going to get better. So what does it mean to bring civic virtue and value to those kinds of questions? How do we deal with the questions that are dividing us as a political order, uh, as, as a community? How do we get beyond the social, social question divisions that are so profoundly divisive in our society? How do we get to a better place in terms of our respectful engagement with one another? How do we think about our politics? Too many of us, and I'll confess to guilt on this subject myself, have just turned into un uh, dissipated spect spectators, not dissipated, disappointed spectators, watching an unpleasant uh, act play out elsewhere, but feeling helpless to do anything about it. Yet the fact of the matter is we could do something about it. We could, in fact, be arguing and organizing to make sure that our politics serve the vision and values of our democracy. And the problems at home are, are equally compelling. Poverty, war, suffering, and the hopes that we have as a community for creating a world in which there is sustenance for everyone and everyone's human dignity is respected. Illiteracy and its effects, when, when we know that the future lies in education as the pathway to opportunity. Your students are already uh, 
deeply concerned about energy and the environment. I see that everywhere I go. I don't have to talk to your students to know that this matters to them passionately. How does our research and innovation capacity as a university help us build resources for a more sustainable environment? Terrorism and fear have become something we take for granted, but what does it mean, in fact, to organize to bring law and justice and freedom and democracy to other parts of the world? What about our role as the, uh, our historic role in global leadership as the world's most powerful and influential democracy? How do students connect their learning to those questions? What does it mean for us to try to remain a voice for freedom uh, and democratic values and democratic self-determination at a moment when our politics are so frozen? The challenges at home and abroad are absolutely essential, absolutely daunting, uh, and liberal education is what we most need to build the capacity and the commitment, capacity and commitment together, to tackle these problems successfully. Your students do need to be the change. All of our students need to be the change. And by connecting what they learn in college to the needs of the wider world, we build that capacity to take responsibility for our future uh, and ownership of our democracy. So if we think only about the civic and democratic mission of our institutions, we, we need to make sure our students are working on uh, developing the capacity to envision alternatives, not just to know what we have, but to think beyond the known to the unknown and the possible. They need the analytical skills that you work on so, so successfully across the entire educational experience, and they need to bring those analytical skills to the weighing of alternatives, different conceptions of the, of the path forward. We need to work uh, on developing our capacity to solve problems across difference, not just within our borders, but working with partners in our, in our community and in other parts of the world. We need, as you have so wonderfully uh, understood in your plan for the Madison Collaborative, we need the wisdom to take ethical questions and responsibilities seriously into consideration in all the other things that I've been talking about. These are not practical problems to be solved, they are problems where, where important ethical questions are at stake and, and developing the capacity and the wherewithal to see the ethical implications of our practical problems is part of the gift that you can give to our democracy. And we need to graduate people who are prepared to devote time and talent to the making of a better world. You have an extraordinary history here. You can build on it as you take that forward. And now I want to turn to another dimension of this vision, not just the uh, engaging the, the big problems and the big questions, but actually developing practices that take students deeply into exploration and analysis of those practices. You are in a draft phase, uh, advanced draft as I understand it, of your strategic plan, and it calls for JMU to make what are called high impact practices a central part of the educational experience here. And in making that recommendation, uh, your colleagues were drawing on work in which AACNU has had a hand, but really only a hand in raising up a mirror to the inventors of these practices on campuses, yours and many others. So here is the list of uh, designated um, evidence-based high-impact practices that many are looking at when they think about how we connect the goals, the vision, and the actual experiences of students in day-to-day hands-on learning. Uh, and for those of you who are faculty, and as you look at this list, how many of you yourself are already involved in one or more of these high-impact practices? Quite a few. Um, the, the longer definitions of them is on page seven of your handout. And the fact of the matter is that every one of these things, whether we're talking about first-year experiences or learning communities or writing intensive courses or collaborative learning, undergraduate research, diversity and global learning, service learning, capstone projects, internships, every one of these has been a separate, distinct reform movement in higher education. Faculty invented these practices, and they did so with today's students and your needs in mind. Uh, in order to provide a more empowering and fulfilling education for students. The LEAP campaign noticed these practices and began to, to look harder at the research in them, and one of our colleagues, George Koo, who is the founder of the so-called National Study of Student Engagement, or NESI, uh, once we had put this list together, not labeled high-impact practices, went back and looked at the NESI research to show, because NESI was already asking students questions about, did you do certain things? and was asking students questions about their learning. And what Nessie was able to demonstrate was that these the more students do these kinds of practices, 
uh, the, more, uh, the better their success in higher education. The, the seminal work on this is called High Impact Educational Practices, What They Are, Who Has Access to Them, Why They Matter, by George Koo. Uh, and I've given you a couple of snapshots on your handout of some of the findings that educators are studying with success, uh, with great interest. And I want to underscore the point that general, a strong, well-organized, common intellectual experience, such as your general education program, is one of those high-impact practices, and that every student who comes to JMU is going through exactly one of those practices, and others as well, as the curriculum provides opportunities. So you see at the top of page eight, this is a study coming out of a public institution in California, comparing the experience of Latino students with the experience of other students, and what they're noticing is that the more experiences students have of multiple high-impact practices, the higher the graduation rate. For the Latino students, top left-hand side of this page, the graduation rate doubles if they have had as many as three or four high-impact practices. For the comparison group, which is everybody else, the benefit is still great, but the, the completion rate for students who don't have higher, high impact practices was not as high, not as low. Uh, so there's a gain for everyone, but the real benefit comes from multiple experiences of high impact practices. Uh, down here on the bottom of page eight, you're seeing uh, uh, summaries of findings from Nessie scales for different kinds of learning. Deep learning is also integrative learning. Students perceive themselves bringing things together or they are making gains in general education, or they see themselves gaining personal power or practical skills. All of these are positively correlated with, with participation in any high impact practice, but multiples are better. We are about to bring out of a fourth from AIC and you within a few weeks a, a yet another study that takes a look at the effect of high impact practices on first generation and other students who um, may in the past have been poorly served by higher education. Again, looking at the effects of multiple experiences of high impact practices on the learning. And here, uh, the, the scale is a Nessie scale for various kinds of learning that was put together for this study. It was done in three state systems. And um, as you see, overwhelmingly, the more experiences students have of, of this kind of learning, the better their self-reported perception of significant learning gains in college. Now, the thing that strikes me about all of this is that there was no national plan to uh, develop and map high impact practices in an organized way across the curriculum. You're an exception in that you have an exceptionally well-designed general education program that every student experiences when they come in the doors of JMU. For a lot of students, there isn't any common intellectual experience in gen ed. It's just a random selection of courses. Um, and it's, it is in fact the case, what, the, what we did was to make service learning available here or undergraduate research available there or internships somewhere else, left it to students to find their way to these things, and we're still getting incredible evidence of the benefits of multiple experiences for students. So that raises the question for me, and I hope for you, suppose we went about this in a more purposeful way. Suppose there were a plan to build on, in your case, a strong general education program, intentional guidance to intended high impact practices and suppose that those practices were in fact um, connected to your civic mission. So to summarize, when students are engaged in these practices, they're more likely um, to complete, they're more likely to achieve the intended learning outcomes, and they have particular benefit, the Nessie research shows this, for students who are who come from minority communities or who start with lower test scores, the students who often are least likely to succeed in higher education. Um, the research on the learning is captured in this study, uh, Five High Impact Practices, Research on Learning Outcomes, Completion, and Quality. There's a 180-page meta-study that's on AAC's website, and a more accessible, shorter version of those findings is available through, through AAC and U. Now, the question is why do these work and how does the things that make them work connect to your interest in deepening your civic and ethical commitments and achievements as a university? So let me put this question to you. We have faculty in the room who are involved in all of these. Uh, taking it as a more or less established that these practices work for higher levels of completion and higher levels of learning, what is it that makes them work in your judgment? Faculty who raised their hands and said, I'm doing some of these. Why do you suspect that the high impact practices might actually work? I'm
I am going to wait until someone raises his or her hand. <laughs> Why do we suspect that they might actually work? Those of you who are engaged with, whether, whether it's service learning or undergraduate research or capstone projects or writing across the curriculum, writing intensive courses, why do you think these things work for students? The student has an opportunity to take ownership of his or her own learning, to own the question, to turn to you as mentors and resources and perhaps to other students and other members of a team. But the, the action moves to the student's center of gravity and we do become guides to their learning rather than the uh, people who are filling their heads with things that they need to know. Other insights as to why these might work. I don't have particular... Okay, because it involves this, pardon me? It involves the student directly. Right, involves the student directly, exactly. Uh, other um, insights as to why these practices seem to be working? Right, the student becomes a co-maker uh, of the, the insights, it becomes, it comes to understand how we do establish knowledge by becoming involved in the messy practice of testing hypotheses and dealing with uh, conflicting evidence and coming to reasoned judgments, powers of the mind, about what is at stake there. Well, I knew you would know the answers to these questions, so um, I, I thought I would put it to you. Uh, we're reasonably persuaded that what goes on is that these high-impact practices create an engaged and supportive community, as co-op does. It involves students with purposeful learning, where they take, take ownership of it. Uh, it involves them in higher order inquiry and exploration and analysis and problem solving, but it also connects the learning with questions that matter to the students. And for many of the high impact practices, things like internships or service learning, often diversity experiences, some global learning experiences, it gets students working with a wider community. So they come to see the implications and applications of what they're learning in yet an, a broader context. And not least, because the students are working with other people for the most part, they are having to engage perspectives different than their own as they try to make sense of what they are learning and finding. Um, and this, uh, the research is overwhelming that the more experience a student has with genuinely competing perspectives, views, and life experiences, the higher the gains on things like critical thinking and analysis and problem solving. So all of this is why people are excited about high impact practices, but they also offer an opportunity to make civic and ethical inquiry pervasive. And that's what I want to talk about for the, for the last few minutes of these remarks. Uh, because every one of these experiences provides an opportunity for us to engage students with those big questions, to involve them in the kind of analytic, deep probing work and consultation with others that is central to good learning, but also to good civic and ethical responsibility. And the curriculum can become, uh, and I think your Mad Madison Collaborative is already pointing the way, far more purposeful in the way it builds on general education to take students into these issues as undergraduates uh, and eventually graduates of this institution. So general education can, and I know it here it already does, engage students with big questions, with the kind of illustrative questions that we were just talking about, that the world faces and that our democracy faces. I know this is going on here. I, had, I stopped in one undergraduate class this afternoon. Are those students here, the students who are in the global learning class? No? Uh, yes? Oh, okay. And, and so you, making a presentation, uh, a dispiriting presentation, one has to say, on human trafficking. Your students are engaging some of the world's really tough questions, and they are loaded with ethical and civic responsibility issues. Uh, and they are doing it because they care about these issues. Um, so this is already happening both in general education and in other parts of the curriculum. The question is whether our research experiences help students build deeper capacities to go deeper into these questions and to take them to another level. Whether they're working with the, um, the biology that relates to cancer or HIV AIDS or other social problems, whether they're working on genomic uh, development. There are a, mil a million issues that students can dive into through their research uh, and explore both the ethical and social implications and applications of the work they're doing. Majors uh, can, and I, this is the recommendation of your Madison Collaborative, make this pervasive across the curriculum. Uh, service learning and internships provide other ways for students to, to bring additional perspectives, not just academic perspectives, but community perspectives to all of this. So the entire panoply of high impact practices, if strategically mapped across the educational program in ways that make sense to different departments and different fields of study, 
do provide yet a higher level of meaning to your own motto, helping students be the change uh, and making civic and ethical inquiry a signature of this institution in a deep, profound, and knowledge-generating kind of way. So that's my final suggestion to you. And if we go to the last page of the handout, I'll try to, try to put in front of you the opportunity that I think you have as a university with a very solid commitment to civic responsibility, ethical engagement, a strong foundation in your general education program, and so much good work going on all over the entire educational institution. This is a map of a, uh, borrowed from another institution that shall be nameless. Uh, but I have adapted it quite a bit for this presentation to try to illustrate what I'm talking about and make it less theoretical, more abstract. So this is an institution which also has a well-conceived general education program. Uh, and at that institution, there is a midpoint opportunity for students to take a seminar in which they take stock of what they've gotten out of their early courses and identify the ethical, personal, and career issues that matter to them as the people they are becoming. Um, they do it as a course. You could just do it as a workshop. There are a whole lot of ways to invite students to take stock of what they got out of the first two years of college as they are moving to a higher level. But it's the rest of this that I find interesting. At this particular institution, students are being involved to put together a set of courses that are thematically organized around a question that matters to the student. Not a question that we gave them and said, write a paper on this, but a question that matters to the student a question for which they become the architect and owner, a question that could be tied to one or more of the undergrad. I put the little hip circle in there. We had to squeeze it into this design. You see, <laughs> it's smaller than I mean it to be. But the student might choose undergraduate research, might choose service, might choose to connect their question to an internship or to study abroad. The choice of the high impact practice would be the students, but the expectation would be that there's a hands-on component to the student's exploration of a big question that matters to them as an individual and matters to the choice of field in which they have uh, placed their primary hopes for preparation for the future. So the core recommendation is that you think hard about taking your own commitment to civic and ethical learning to the highest possible level by challenging every one of your students as he or she enters to understand that before they graduate from JMU, building on the foundation of general education, we're going to invite them to take ownership of a big problem that matters to them and to develop a plan for pursuing that in the context of their advanced studies. So the major isn't just fulfilling the right number of courses in the right categories, the right 300s and 400s. It's not even just a capstone. It's actually the student becoming an investigator and an explorer, somebody who is herself or himself taking responsibility for a question that matters to them and a question that matters to our society. I think you have done such extraordinary work as an institution that you are prepared and poised to take this ne next level move to make, uh, we were talking at lunch about this, uh, what would we call it, the Madison project that, that each student undertakes or the civic learning project. I don't know what your name will be, but to make, a sig make it a JMU signature that a student who comes here is going to do meaningful, self-directed work at a high level of quality work that has an ethical component, work that has uh, a scholarly component, and work that takes on an issue that matters to our society. So that's the suggestion. I look forward to your response to it, and I thank you for your uh, patient attention. As well. <laughs> Okay, I'm sure there are concerns. <laughs> so uh, let me know um, what you'd like to add to this conversation. You are the experts on what works for your students, and I am, and you are the students who are benefiting from this institution. So I'm eager to hear from you. Uh, the question was, um, would I comment on what I've just said in the momentum toward MOOCs? Um, Yes, I would. I think that we are facing a real digital choice. Um, there's a digital moment um, that higher education uh, confronts, and it can be an opportunity for us to move engaged learning practices to center stage by 
moving a great deal of the work that now occupies faculty and student time to other, sor other sorts of learning. Uh, um, so that our, what have traditionally been our lectures become background resources as textbooks are uh, for the learning that goes on. And the classroom space is free not necessarily just to be classroom space. It might be research space. It might be more time for hands-on learning. But it's faculty and staff working together uh, um, with students on the important implications of what people are studying and learning in their, their textbooks. Uh, I personally I am wholly underwhelmed by the potential of MOOCs themselves. Uh, it seems to me it takes our weakest pedagogy and makes it exponentially more available, the pedagogy of lecturing and, and routinized tests and final exams. Routinized tests and final exams reward standardized thinking but we're in a moment as a society when unstandardized thinking is exactly what we need. So MOOCs themselves strike me as um, a bad bet and one that has no business model. It has great hype and no business model. But I worry, I will say that I worry, and I'll share this with this institution, which has done such splendid work with general education. I worry that the business model they have is to take MOOCs to broad access open enrollment institutions and make them the gen ed program. Uh, a fragmented, disconnected, impossibly incoherent program that can't work on the kinds of skills and responsibilities we're talking about. I worry about that a lot. And AACNU is doing what it can to prevent, to present alternatives uh, to that direction for general education for, for broad access institutions. Well, I think there's, there's two answers to that question. Uh, I, 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 but I'd be interested in your own answer to that question. How can, uh, you're in physics. How can we scale some of the practices that you'd like to move forward? What, what do you see as the opportunities? Or are you actually frustrated with this? Well, I, I'm not frustrated because I think that we've been, been given a lot of resources, but we just keep asking for more, more resources. And, and at some point, that runs out. It hasn't for us yet. So. <laughs> right, well, to, when I think about JMU, I think this is an institution which 20 years ago did not have a great general education program, and it chose to organize its resources and its, to have a very far-reaching investment of faculty time and talent and energy to make general education matter educationally to your students, um, and that has paid off demonstrably. Um, so uh, to, my, to my mind, part of the answer is, what is it we really want to do? I'm a big believer in undergraduate research, and I don't believe that it has to always be done outside the curriculum. I think our challenge is to map inquiry-based learning and research projects, research-based projects, into the courses students are doing that are, for which they're already paying tuition and which we're, in which we're already investing resources. I, whenever I think about the recommendations AACNU is making, I always think about my own expertise in early modern history, and I think, hmm, um, how would I connect my content with uh, the kinds of things we're talking about? And the fact of the matter is, I would make my course writing intensive or research intensive, uh, so that it's doing double duty. It's teaching rich content, but it's also helping students develop those capacities that make a difference. But I, I do think, um, this is an opportunity for us to ask hard about any course we're teaching that isn't getting students involved in developing the kind of hands-on, analytical, intellectual work uh, that, um, that they need. Uh, so a great deal of faculty time is still going into lecturing, uh, and there are other ways to have access to that, to that information. So I think the digital opportunity is for us to, to think hard about what matters most in terms of content, in terms of deep engagement and inquiry, analysis, ethical reasoning, civic responsibility, and ask where we can have less expensive access to things we need while doubling down on the, on the kinds of learning for which faculty are indispensable uh, and where students cannot get what they need from an education unless they are working with you. Um, so that, that would be my answer, that it's, it's, it's intentionality, it's systematic, commitment by an institution to do some things well and not to try to do everything, but it's also asking where are there really opportunities in the digital revolution for us to spend less time on things that have occupied a great deal of our budgets uh, and more time on the things that we know work, but that right now seem costly. Yes, uh, are you? Yeah, tell me who you are. Oh, sorry, my name is Nelson, I'm a graduate student here in the Master's in College Student First Administration Program. I'm curious if you have any concerns about whether K-12 education would adequately prepare students for an education like this, or if you see them as kind of separate and not necessarily connected enough that that makes a difference. Uh, I 
see parts of the reform agenda in K-12 going in exactly this direction. Um, the, the, K the common core standards have been utterly silent on the question of civic, global, or ethical learning. Um, so I wouldn't look to reform in K-12 for those aspects of preparation. Um, although there is obviously a big service learning movement in the schools, and that's one thing you can build on. But um, the common core standards are, if they're ever appropriately implemented, doubling down on inquiry-based learning. They want to get students doing many more kinds of writing and research projects uh, as, as pre-undergraduates. Pre now, if we had an entire generation of students arriving on campus having done research experiences, having done a lot of writing and research of different kinds, uh, they would be much better positioned to take advantage of the kinds of things you're offering uh, and to take it to a higher level. I actually had a, a rather inspiring conversation with people from the college board the other day. In effect, general education is the biggest academic program in the country, one that everyone does, but the other, the big, one of the biggest versions of general education is AP. The AP courses have become an alternative for a whole lot of students to getting their gen eds out of the way, as we like to say. Um, and, um, and the College Board is actually worried. The new president of the College Board was a key leader in the Common Core reform movement, so he sees the connections that need to be made. So they're worried that so much of the AP experience is not deep enough. Uh, may not require research papers at all, lots of reading, lots of big focus on the exam. Uh, and so they are trying out in, I think, 100 cities and hoping to go national with, uh, in effect, an AP, I guess it's certificate, that would involve students as juniors in high school in doing a pre-research seminar to get, get some experience in what it means to actually develop a research question and tackle it. And then to the full certificate would involve at least four AP courses, plus this research seminar, plus a significant uh, senior paper on the IB model, uh, so that students would, in effect, have integrative interdisciplinary learning. They'd be drawing from more than one discipline as they developed their research topic. To my mind, you know, that we should all be cheering that idea on. Uh, it would lay such a wonderful foundation for um, the kind of liberal learning we're trying to provide here. Um, how, again, students, uh, the, first of all, all your hands up if you're a student. Okay, so how many of you did significant research papers in high school? Okay, about half of the hands uh, that were up as students went up again for those research papers. So some of our students are already getting this uh, before they get here, but not everybody is, and um, especially in urban areas, uh, you're lucky to have, do any writing at all, frankly, in the schools, uh, much less to do serious analytic writing of the sort that, that a school like this prizes. Maybe uh, one more question. Um, oh, I bear, I, I'm a deep believer in the curriculum. <laughs> I, I think you need a framework and architecture of purposes and organized educational practices, and I think a well-designed curriculum provides a lot of structure and guidance at the beginning to get students on the right pathways, and then over time is turning more and more of the ownership and responsibility to them, so that at the end they are indeed self-directed learners, people who, as I suggested, uh, have come to care passionately and, and academically about addressing and, and engaging and studying a, a significant problem and doing it to a high degree of quality. So I absolutely would have a curriculum, but uh, that curriculum would always involve a, a lot of different kinds of hands-on learning, some of which would be community-based and some of which would be scholarly. In a, I have a pretty traditional sense of scholarship, actually. <laughs> so what about you? Would you do away with the curriculum? Or did you draw that from what I had to say? <laughs> absolutely. What, what happens in the course, whether or not uh, and, and that's what I like about your general education program. You have a pretty clear idea of what is supposed to be going on in those courses. Um, and um, all kinds of ways that both faculty and students are brought into some sense of clarity about what we're trying to do here. I know it's not perfect. You don't need to tell me that. Um, <laughs> but it's so much better than what a lot of institutions do. And, and that's my goal, not just to have students checking courses off a list, but to have them be helped early and often and repeatedly to see that they are on an educational journey, that it has certain necessary components to it, 
that are in their long-term interest and that will lead to those good jobs, but will also lead to better learning and to hopefully better communities as well. So, well, thank you very much. This has been a lot of fun. Wow, uh, Carol, this has just been a thrill to have you here, first of all. This is a date many of us had circled on our calendars for a long time. We had really wanted this lecture series to elevate the discourse within our own institution and community about these very important issues and about our future. And you have done that for us today. You've given us a great gift at a time when there's a lot of gloom and doom when we open the newspapers. But here today, I think you've lifted our spirits and our sights in a very important and helpful way. So thank you so much. This is a token of our appreciation on behalf of the university. Thank you so much Thank you. for all that you're doing. It was really my pleasure and my honor. And uh, you have brought uh, yet another generation of inspired leadership to this institution. Uh, you and I have known each other for a long time, as you said. And we have seen the civic value of, of, of our commitment to, shared commitment to inclusion. So it was frankly uh, inspiring and something of a relief from the daily, <laughs> daily responsibilities I have to think through this talk and try to connect it with what you've already done here. So Great. thank, thank you. you, Carol. And, and thank you all so much for being here. Please do continue to come back for the Madison Vision Series. And if you have suggestions for us, for future speakers, please let us know. We want this to be a relevant and important series for our entire community. So again, thank you all so much for coming, and we look forward to seeing you soon right here. Bye-bye.